we have a small child ah <laughs> uh, hello sister how are you sister unmute yourself sister rupa oh hello sir we have professor amir hasan my teacher and uh, former faculty of saint anne's college of education hello assalam sir. assalam alaikum amir hasan sahib please unmute yourself sir i think we are uh, the live streaming on youtube is done it's yes, ready yes dorothy yes yes parita hello hello sir hello sir nice to see you uh yes sister we shall go ahead then yeah we have uh, we are ready with youtube live streaming oh that i think we may begin dr sharmila and dr rose yes yes sister <laughs> a day to remember refresh and reconnect refresh the learning to grow as a professional and reconnect with our sister i think uh, you okay i was yeah muted. rose only you unmute otherwise i i muted all the others okay 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 a day to remember refresh and reconnect refresh the learning to grow as a professional and reconnect with our classmates teachers and colleagues maybe after years for some uh, there is a very bad echo it's difficult to understand okay uh, you not able to hear ma'am uh, no i can hear but there is an echo you know with the voice so i think one of the microphone some device will have to okay um... good morning everyone can you hear me now uh, sister dorothy uh, am i uh, audible now rose you are audible to me you are audible to me very clear I yes audible, audible and clear Okay, okay it will be dear participants it will be clear if you all mute yourself except rose rest all of you kindly mute it will be all right okay oh uh, is your uh, speaker on by any chance who's my yeah yeah my speaker is on because if your uh, your piece and the speaker is on right then it will echo just use one medium of uh, yeah i remove you are audible rose you are audible you can continue okay a very good morning to the mother josephine memorial lecture 2021 on this virtual platform for the first time due to the global pandemic honorable chief guest kamla bhasan feminist activist new delhi sister shamita ac the provincial superior apostolic carmel karnataka province Sister Shubha AC, the Educational Secretary, Apostolic Carmel Educational Society. Sister Mary Lucy AC, the Joint Secretary, Saint Anne's Institutions and Superior Saint Anne's Convent. Sister Zina Pereira AC, the President of the Alumni Association. Sister Mary Rupa AC, the Administrator. Dr. Sharmila Maskarenis, Assistant Professor and Secretary of the Alumni Association. alumni executive committee members alumni heads of various institutions former staff and my dear colleagues special invitees and students a warm welcome to each one back to the alma mater sarpa aur gaya discomfort of college of education mangaluru the first women's college of education in karnataka was started to meet the precise need of establishment of teacher training colleges along the west coast to prepare teachers for secondary school education the college from its very inception has ensured to equip prospective teachers with the knowledge attitudes and skills they require to perform their task effectively in the classroom 
school and wider community as a mark of dedication to the cause of education. In the year 1927, Mother M. Josephine A.C. was a superior general of the Apostolic Carmel. She was a pioneer who instituted St. Anne's College on July 1st, 1943. To venerate the service of Mother M. Josephine A.C., we have been holding the Mother Josephine Memorial Lecture from the year 1994. Prayer is an invocation of the heart, a calling forth of divine energies to be manifested in one's life. With these thoughts in mind, let us begin this remarkable day by seeking God to share his choicest blessings on all of us gathered here as Sister Jean A.C. and Sister Lavishanti A.C., the first semester of BS students, lead us into prayer. request Sister Zina Pereira AC, the President of the Alami Association and our principal to welcome our speaker Kamla Basan and all the participants on this virtual gathering. Respected resource person, Mrs. Kamala Basan, members of the management, alumni, former staff, well-wishers, special invitees, heads and staff of the institutions on the campus, members of the faculty and students. A very good morning to all of you. I feel honored to welcome all of you to the Mother Josephine Memorial Lecture 2021 on this online platform. St. Anne's College of Education Autonomous Founded in 1943, Mother Josephine, the third and the fifth superior general of the Apostolic Kamal Congregation. Mother Josephine, a great visionary and a noble leader, explored and ventured into new vistas of women's education. St. Anne's College of Education, upholding her vision, has been striving to prepare teachers of high caliber to build up precious human resources for society and spread the light of wisdom and knowledge to humanity. Our alumni, join hands with us in this mission of our institution through the Alumni Association. Our alumni have continuously shared their professional expertise and enriched St. Anne's College of Education through their experience in various fields. The annual Mother Josephine Memorial Lecture is one such venture of the Alumni Association. Through this, we try to discover the recent trends and developments in the field of education. On this auspicious occasion, it is my privilege to welcome all of you to this enriching and enriching session and 
our thinking caps on, we have amidst us the resource person and the chief guest, Mrs. Kamla Bhasin, a feminist activist from New Delhi. Ma'am will be ma'am will be addressing us on the topic gender equality and inclusion in education, a map for transformation in education. We are grateful to you, ma'am, for accepting our invitation and giving us the privilege of enriching ourselves on behalf of the management, students, alumni, and guests. I extend a hearty welcome to you, ma'am. We are glad to have amidst us Sister Mari Lucy AC, Superior and Joint Secretary of St. Anne's College of Education. Your presence has doubled our joy. A cordial welcome to you, Sister. We are happy to have with us Sister Maria Shamita AC, the Vice President of the Epistolic Kamal Educational Society. Sister Maria Shubha AC, the Educational Secretary, the Apostolic Kamal Society, Karnataka Province. Thank you, Sister, for the support and encouragement you extend to us in all our ventures. A warm welcome to you, Sisters. The presence of our former staff enhances our joy for your continued support and your interest in our growth. Your love and commitment towards the institution always inspired and motivated us. A gracious welcome to all of you. A cordial welcome to all of you who have been the torchbearers of this great institution. We will always remain grateful for your loyalty and support. We are glad that you are with us. The encouraging presence of the heads and the staff of the institutions on the campus on this online platform has affirmed us your support. A loving welcome to all of you. We have all, we all have with us the sisters of the Provincial House and St. Anne's Convent who have always guided and encouraged us. A, cheer, a cheerful welcome to all of you, dear sisters. The joint efforts of Dr. Sister Maria Rupa AC, the administrator, Dr. Sister de Souza AC, the Vice Principal, Dr. Sharmila Mascarenas, the Secretary of the Alumni Association, the members of Alumni Executive Committee, has made this day a reality. While I remain grateful to you for your keen interest, I extend a cordial welcome to all of you. A hearty welcome to all our guests, well-wishers and students. Wish you a very fruitful time during this session. May God bless us all. Thank you, Sister, for your affectionate words of welcome. May I now call upon Dr. Farita Vegas, Principal, St. Aloysius Institute of Education, Mangaluru, and a vibrant member of the Alumni Executive Committee to introduce the Chief Guest, Kamla Basin, to all of us. Thank you, Rose. Good morning and a warm welcome to all. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce to you Ms. Kamala Basin, a famous feminist activist and a social scientist. She was born in Mandi Bahudin district in Pakistan and grew up around the villages of Rajasthan. She graduated with an MA degree from Jaipur University and then went on to study sociology of development at University of Münster in West Germany. Returning from Germany in 1972, she started work in Udaipur in a non-government organization called Seva Mandir, which was focused on elevating problems of water scarcity and poverty in the area. This experience transformed her into becoming a feminist at an intellectual and emotional level. Kamla Basin is a social scientist who has been actively engaged in issues of gender equality, education, poverty elevation, human rights, and peace in South Asia since the 1970s. Based in New Delhi, 
She is known for her feminist ideology and activism, as well as for founding Sangat, a South Asian network that combines feminist theory with action at the grassroots level. Currently, she works with Sangat as advisor, as well as Jagori, a women's resource and training center and Jagori Rural Charitable Trust as an active member. She is the South Asia coordinator of One Billion Rising, a global campaign to end violence against women and girls. Co-chair of the worldwide network, Peace Women Across the Globe, and member of South Asians for Human Rights. Prior to this, she worked with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations for 27 years, where she identified innovative development work in Asian countries and created networks between people across countries. To add to her achievement, she has written books and booklets about understanding patriarchy and gender that has been translated into nearly 30 languages. In her writings and activism, she envisions a feminist movement that transcends class, borders, and other social and political divisions. She has also written a large number of songs and slogans for the women movement, books for children, and has created many posters and banners for various people's movements. She is committed to the creation of a peaceful, democratic, and pluralistic South Asia. We are indeed too proud to have you, ma'am, deliver the Mother Josephine Memorial Lecture 2021, St. Anne's College of Education, Mangalore, on the topic, Gender Equality and Inclusion in Education, a map for transformation in education. A warm welcome to you, ma'am, once again. Thank you very much. I suppose I start. Yes, Rose. Yeah, <laughs> okay, you can start, but I felt like uh, thanking ma'am now, and after that you start, ma'am. All right, please thank her. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Parita, for that explicit introduction about the distinguished speaker. So, and our goal here today is to make this platform as inclusive and productive as ever, with the shared thoughts of our renowned speaker, Kamla Basin. So let us recreate ourselves as we look forward to the speaker. So I, uh, I just have to make a small announcement. I request all participants to drop in your queries on the chat box, which shall be answered during the open discussion after the talk. Without further ado, I shall now present to you Kamla Basin. Over to you, ma'am. Equality, Zindabad, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Zindabad, the Indian Constitution, Zindabad. I'm honored and delighted to be invited to give this memorial talk to honor the amazing Mother M. Josephine A.C. Before I proceed, I just want to say that my surname is pronounced as Bhasin, not as Bhasin, just so that you know. Kamla Bhasin. So friends, I'm in awe of Mother Josephine's personality, her love and dedication to God and to the marginalized people in God's kingdom or queendom. I am in awe of her desire to serve the exploited and the oppressed. I am in awe of the amazing work Mother did to create orphanages, convents, schools and colleges in different parts of India. No wonder. She was honored with the Kaiser Hind silver medal by the British government in India for her 
public service to women's education. Thousands of girls and women educated over the years. My deepest regards and appreciation to this amazing, in my opinion, feminist mother, Josephine. I also wish to salute the stellar work done by St. Anne's College since its birth to prepare competent teachers, dedicated teachers for our schools. We are lucky to have such feminist philanthropists, dedicated foremothers and forefathers. Let us all close our eyes for just half a minute, thinking of every foremother and forefather who has brought us women to this place where so many of us sit on this platform with PhD degrees, sisters, principals. If these four mothers had not been there, you and I would not be here. Thank you. Now, an explanation. I am not a scholar, a philosopher, a thinker, etc. I'm basically an activist, a facilitator of informal life education, a facilitator of education for change and transformation. I create networks of like-minded people and groups. I organize campaigns and support movements towards equality, justice, and human rights. I am basically into people. I'm into people's networks. I'm into solidarity. So even during COVID, anyone invites me and say, would you talk to us? I say yes, because I'm into people. I want to connect with more and more people and recruit them for the human rights movement. That's my purpose and that's why I'm here. Now, a few words about education, what it means to me. For me, the main purpose of education is to make my life and the life of the community better, more equal, more just, more loving, more loving. The purpose of education for me is not to get a PhD or a master's degree. That for me is not at all the purpose. I believe in this four to 5,000 year old Sanskrit shloka, four words about education. Sa vidya ya vimuktaye. Education is that which liberates, which frees us from our ignorance, greed, envy, which frees us from all our weaknesses. This is education for me. So for me, education without human values can be evil and destructive. And sadly today, most education is without human values. And it is mainly, in my opinion, educated well-off people like me who are destroying the world. They are the most corrupt, the most greedy, the biggest polluters. And I can go on with figures. It is even more important for schools of education, which prepare teachers 
to give them human values. I wish to share a poem written by me many, many years ago, which in a way further explains what education means and especially what girls' education should mean. It's called, because I'm a girl, I must study. A father asks his daughter, study, why should you study? I have sons of plenty who can study. Girl, why should you study? The daughter tells her father, since you ask, here is what, why I must study. Because I'm a girl, I must study. Meaning if I was a boy, maybe I did not need to study. Because I'm a girl, I must study. Long denied this right, I must study. For my dreams to take flight, I must study. Knowledge brings new light, so I must study. For the battles I must fight, I must study. Because I'm a girl, I must study. To avoid destitution, I must study. To win independence, I must study. To fight frustration, I must study. To find inspiration, I must study. Because I'm a girl, I must study. To fight men's violence, I must study. To end my own silence, I must study. To challenge patriarchy, I must study. To challenge all hierarchy, I must study. Because I'm a girl, I must study. To mold a faith I can trust, meaning have religions which I can trust. To mold a faith that I can trust, I must study. To make laws that are just, I must study. To sweep centuries of dust, I must study. To challenge what I must, I must study. Because I'm a girl, I must study. To know right from wrong, I must study. To find a voice that is strong, I must study. To write a feminist song, I must study. To make a world where I belong, I must study. Because I'm a girl, I must study. So friends, this is what for me education is. And we need to see, is this the kind of education we are giving? Or we are giving an education for a piece of paper, which is sometimes not worth that paper. Now to the topic, the gender, gender equity and inclusion, a map for transformation in education. So obviously first I have to share my understanding of the concept of gender. Because I don't know what is your understanding of this concept, which is relatively new. Most of us, or many of us at least, think we know the concept, but actually we don't. So let me begin in a very simple way. All of us have two identities. One is our biological identity. So when we are born naked, we come out of the mother's womb. The people around us look at one tiny part of our body, the penis or the vulva, and declare, oh, a girl is born, a boy is born, and in some cases where the two organs are not clear, 
an intersex person is born. This today is called sex, my biological definition. This is sex. And please see that except for that tiny little part of our body, everything else in our bodies are the same. There is no other difference. And for the next 11, 12, 13 years, there will be no other difference between a girl and a boy from the side of mother nature, just this difference. And later on, a few more differences, menstruation, bigger breasts, men's little bigger voice, more body hair on men's faces, etc. That's it. Even now, 95% of our bodies are the same. And let's look clearly, why did nature make male, females? Only one purpose, reproduction. We were not made male or female, who will become the Pope and who will become the Dalai Lama and who will become the Prime Minister. We were made male or female only. Who? will take more responsibility for reproduction. Now, I have no idea why Mother Nature did not trust the males and did not give them more responsibility. She has given us women more responsibility to keep the baby in our womb for nine months and then the power to breastfeed for as long as I want, one year, two years. This is our biological definition. This is the same all over the world, given nature only for one purpose. Gender, on the other hand, is not created by nature. Gender is created by society. It is a social construct. Gender is a definition of how should a girl behave, how should a boy behave. I think some people have again unmuted themselves. It is very disturbing for me, so I request once again the organizers to take care of it and the others, please. Very difficult, friends, for me to speak on this platform. So gender is a social construct. This dupatta is gender. I was not born with it. I can leave it. The puttu and the tali and all the saris and the lipsticks, this is gender. And the neckties of men, British neckties of men, and all the British clothes, which most men wear today, that is gender. Artificial, created from outside. Gender is like caste. Nature didn't make us Brahmins and Shudras. Society did. Gender is like race. Nature did not say the white people are superior. They just said some people born in some continents are dark and some people born in other continents are white. Nature didn't say these are superior people because they don't have beautiful color like ours. Gender basically is about power. It gives power to boys and men and takes away power given to us by nature even, to women. Again, it's like caste. It's like race gives power to Brahmins, power to white people. It's like class. Rich people can do anything. Gender affects 
every aspect of our life. How we are welcomed when we are born. A big azan is given when a son is born in some families and no azan when daughter is born. Big drums are played when a son is born. So it begins with my birth. And today in the days of science, it begins before my birth. They find out if I will be a female. And in this great country of ours, 40 to 50 million girls have been aborted. Why? Because they did not have a penis. For the lack of a penis, 40 to 50 million girls finished. Killed by whom? By an enemy? By China? No. By their own parents. So nobody can even save them. So it even affects my birth. It affects my welcome. It affects the clothes I wear, the hairstyle I have, the shoes I wear, the jewelry I must wear and the cosmetics I must put. Gender tells men they cannot cry. Tells them they can urinate anywhere, stand anywhere in India and urinate. This whole country is a urinal for you. Gender tells me how I should stand, how I should talk, how I should laugh. Gender tells me at what time I have to come back and at what time my brother can come back. Gender decides whether I as a woman will get family property or not whether I'll be married off without asking me. Gender determines the food I'll eat, when I will eat, the education I will get, the dreams I will have, whether I will dream to be a nurse or a surgeon, an air hostess or a pilot. Friends, now I'm saying something really, I consider it very important. Nature believes in diversity. It creates difference. That is why out of the seven and a half billion people in the world, no two people are exactly the same. But nature has never said, this one is superior. And this one is inferior. Tall men are superior, short ones are inferior. Noses like Aishwarya Rai are superior. Noses like Kamla Bhaseen are inferior. Rose is superior to any other flower. Elephant is superior to a mouse. No. No inequality in nature. All inequality is created by us. Casteism, religions, class, race. This is what we need to remember. Actually, friends, it is gender or society which creates inequality. Now, a few more things about gender. Gender is a performance. So when you want to leave your house to come to St. Anne's College, if you are a man, you dress up like a man, tie your mustache, and you are a woman, you put your lipstick on and your bindi on and your best silk sari on. It's a performance. In theater, we perform, but a role for a few days. But this is a lifelong permanent role. Who can give orders? Who will be the master? Who will take orders? It's a performance. And friends, the tragedy is that gender makes both men and women half. Men and women can do everything except men can't do two things which women can do. Produce a baby, and breastfeed. Other than that, men can do everything a woman can do. 
everything. And women can't do only one thing men can do. To impregnate a woman. But gender tells my brother, you will not cook. Gender tells me, you will not ride a bicycle. Gender will tell me, you will not play. Gender will tell my brother, you will not be gentle. You will be rough and tough. Gender tells my brother, you cannot show your emotions. The poor guy can't cry. Gender tells my mother, he cannot knit and he cannot stitch. And he cannot dance. Why? And gender tells me silly things like this. So my brother is half a human being. And I'm half a human being. Two half human beings are prepared for life. None of them can be independent. So friends, we are against gender because it is artificial, it is imposed, it makes us half because it creates inequality, because it takes away rights from one group and gives rights to another group. We feminists have no problem with sex. We are proud of our body. We are proud of our menstruation. We are proud of our breasts given to us to feed people, not to dance in Bollywood and not to be the playthings of men in buses and metros. Those men who go for our breasts in buses, they should remember. Perhaps if they were lucky, a mother would have fed them. And that's why those breasts were made. And if they can't understand, take them to a psychiatrist. They need mental treatment. My next point, friends, is gender is not a problem. <laughs> Funny, no? Gender is not a problem. The, it is a product of a problem. What is the problem? Problem is patriarchy. If there is patriarchy in society, there will have to be gender. Please understand, especially the teachers. What is patriarchy? Very briefly, I have no time. I have only 45 minutes to explain what I take three days to explain. Patriarchy is a social system. My mother who stopped me from whistling was not a bad woman. She was just following the social system she was brought up in and she was teaching me what she had learned. She was not a bad woman. So it is a social system. The man I marry behaves like a lord and master. Swami, not because he's bad. That's what he has been told. He's lord and master. I will touch his feet. I will put his thali. I will take his name. I will come and live in his house. Oh, Raja hai. A king hai king. So why should he not misbehave? This is what he has been told. So it is a social system. And not just in India. It's a global system. If you saw a man called Donald Trump, you will know what patriarchy is and what patriarchal behavior is. It's a global system. In the US, as many women suffer domestic violence as we do percentage-wise in India. Secondly, not just men are patriarchal. Women are also patriarchal. Because we are born in the same Families, same religions, which teach us patriarchy. And yes, all religions today are patriarchal, controlled by men, dictated by men, interpreted by men. 
women cannot be the head of any of these five or six religions which we have. We cannot become the Pope. So what God is this who creates 50% inferior people? I find it difficult to believe in a God which makes me inferior, cannot respect him. I can respect human rights, which says, Kamla, you are equal to your brother. I cannot respect any religion, including mine, which I don't believe in, of course, because it creates caste and it creates patriarchy. So the problem is patriarchy. It is a social system. Next. In patriarchy, by definition, men are considered superior. No question, like in caste, by definition, Brahmins are superior. Third, in patriarchy, men and boys have more control. I'm saying more, not total control. More control over three important things. All resources, including food, education, freedom, property, everything. More decision-making control. More control on ideology, how we think. In the Indian parliament, never have more than 11% women been present. So 90% men decide what India thinks. 100% religions are decided by men, what is right for men and what is right for women. So men are lords and masters in every religion. If God is he, then of course he is God. Every man is God. Pati Parameshwara. Pati Parameshwara. Can you imagine? My constitution says men and women are equal. My religion says, no, he is Pati Parmeshwara. Whom should I believe in today? Indian constitution or my religion? For each one of us to decide. So friends, if there is patriarchy, there will be gender. Boys will have to be taught how to become masters, how to become violent. They will have to be given guns when they are three years old to teach them violence, to teach them force. Girls will have to be given dolls to play with, to serve all their lives, to look after other people. Rich people's daughters play with dolls. Poor people's daughters actually bring up younger siblings. Poor people's daughters start playing cooks. They don't play with toy cooking pots. They play with real cooking pots. It has to be taught. And who is the teacher in patriarchy? Look at the tragedy. Look at the trick of patriarchy. We women have to teach our children patriarchy. See how crooked, how vile, how violent this patriarchy is. I have to teach my daughter to be inferior. Please understand all this. So you have to bring up girls as obedient, as subservient, as silent, as taking violence of all kinds. So friends, Another point is that if there is patriarchy, there will be violence against women. For example, if there is caste, there will be violence against Dalits. So friends, according to me, your topic, to answer your topic, read it again. According to me, you cannot bring gender equity and gender inclusion without removing patriarchy. Forget it. Not possible. Don't play around with this word gender and make it just an academic word. For me, gender is not an academic word. It's the way I am 
forced to live in my life. It's not a chapter in my St. Anne's College curriculum. It is my life. It is your life. It is the life of every man and every woman. So when you say how to bring gender equity and inclusion, my question to you is, the people who made this topic for me, can you expect a patriarchal family to make it inclusive and to say, okay, from now on, our daughters will get equal property? Will our husbands come home every evening and say, my wife also works outside. She teaches in St. Anne's. She's also been working. So I will be in the kitchen with her. Or she will be doing her Zoom calls and I will be in the kitchen without her. Will they do it? Think about it. Will patriarchal religions change their thinking? And say, yes, tomorrow a woman can be a pope. What's the problem? What is the problem? A woman can be an imam. A woman can be a Shankaracharya. 50% of the world population cannot be inferior. And all our leaders, at least in their constitutions, have said men and women are equal. So why are religions not equal? Why are our cultures not equal? Why are our homes not equal? My question to you is, will anyone who is in power give up their power because we talk of inclusion? Have you seen anyone or most people to give up their power? The answer is no. Power has to be taken from people. The Dalits are fighting for centuries. The Blacks are fighting for centuries. And the women have fought for every right of ours. So, people have to struggle against their power in many different ways. So friends, my question is, if gender is artificial, if gender is imposed, do we want to play around with gender and we say, chalo, let's have inclusion, let's have equity. Don't you think in the long run we have to do away with gender? In the long run, we want to demolish patriarchy rather than put some malam patti, some band-aid. Gender inclusion is band-aid. Gender freedom is what we need. A boy can decide what he wants to wear. And in Sweden, there are schools today where they cannot even address a girl as a girl. Because as soon as you say a girl, you say you put on a frock. So in that damned frock of yours in your schools, with that frock, you have taken away all her independence. With that frock, she cannot climb a tree. Because from here, I can see the panty and then I say, oh, your panty is showing. And the fellow with shorts can do everything. As soon as you say a girl, you define her. So there they say, no, no girl, no boy. They can play with what they like. They can dress the way they want. If a boy wants to cook, please. If a girl does not want to cook, please. So, and friends, please, please, please. Remember that the Indian constitution in 1950 said men and women are equal. That means we have to remove gender. We have to remove patriarchy, not just play around with them. Another point which I cannot elaborate because of lack of time. 
I'll just mention. Patriarchy, caste, race, class and religion. They are all interconnected. If I want my son to marry a Hindu against his rights, if I want him to marry a Hindu, I will have to be patriarchal. I will have to control him. So religions cannot move without patriarchy. Caste needs patriarchy to survive. Otherwise, our children will start marrying outside of caste and religion. To have caste, you need patriarchy. To perpetuate religions, you need patriarchy. Control over your daughter and your son and your wife. So, you cannot achieve gender equality, inclusion, without achieving caste equality, religious equality. In India, you cannot mistreat Muslims. No way. The constitution says that is wrong. And no political party can say they should go to Pakistan. These are Muslims who decided to stay in India. This is their country. They made this country. Similarly, Dalits, similarly, Christians. Christianity came to India a thousand years before it went to Scandinavia. So, we have to change all inequalities. We can't just change gender or caste. And people like me, that is why we work on all human rights, human rights of Muslims in India, human rights of Hindus in Pakistan, human rights of Dalits, Adivasis, Christians, Jews. And now friends, I've been told to give you a map for transformation in education. As I told you, I'm not an educationist. I'm not a policy maker and I am not a map maker. What I believe in, I have already said in the beginning, but I'll now tell you through a small story. And the story goes like this. A young Adivasi or a tribal boy asks the leader of the tribe, mother, yes, the leader of a tribe is a woman. Most of us can't even imagine. When I say leader, immediately their brain says man. So we need to change these brains of ours. Mother, according to you, what are the three most important things in the world? This wise old woman closes her eyes, thinks for a long time and says, child, according to me, the first most important thing in life is people. And the second mother? Yeah. Child, the second most important thing in the world is people. And the third most important thing in the world is people. I agree with this leader. That's why I feel we don't need maps. We need new human beings. It is human beings which oppress, which exploit, which violate. And it is human beings which struggle against these things. If we humans change, then the maps 
will change. Then St. Anne's will change. Then every college will change. But as long as their maps and in the print, they are all locked up in the principal's office, <laughs> nothing will happen. Just like we have the best vaccination in the world against patriarchy in India. Patriarchy is the worst virus. And what is the vaccination against patriarchy in India? The Indian constitution. If we all human beings believed in the Indian constitution, today there will not be 50 million women dead because of patriarchy. So I believe it is humans we need to change. And education can be a good tool to change humans. Teachers can play an important role. But unfortunately, education is not free of patriarchy. And a couple of minutes on this, how patriarchal education itself has been and continues to be. Our colleges and universities teach patriarchy. They do not teach gender equality. And they practice patriarchy. How many Me Too cases in universities where professors have been sexually harassing women all over the world? Uniforms of men and women. Delhi University, one of the finest in the country, the timings for boys to come back to hostel. No limits, they can come whenever they want. Women doing PhDs have to come back at seven or eight. A full citizen of India doing a PhD has to come back at seven in a Delhi university. So what are we talking about gender inclusion? And the woman who was fighting against this, against it through that campaign called Pindara Tor, she was then fighting against other atrocities. She was in jail. Her father died of COVID. And for that Pindara Tor crime, that woman was not allowed to come out. After the father died, some judge left his shame and gave her bail three days ago. So friends, do you please try and remember that the first schools of formal education were religious and none of them allowed women entry. None of them. Madarsas mainly for men, Hindu ashrams for men, Christian seminaries mainly for men. Majority. Buddhist Sanghas, mainly for men, although Buddha allowed in 2,500 years ago, the Buddha allowed entry of women into the Sangha. Because women went and demanded it. So religions excluded women from everything. Even today they exclude us from temples. Because we menstruate. Ask one of those men, one of them, to prove that he was born without our menstrual blood. Bring any religious leader who was born without our dirty, impure, napak menstrual blood. Bring me one man. And then I will stop going to any temple. Bring me one man first who was born without our dirty, impure, napak blood. One man. And friends, I thought only religions discriminated. A few years ago, I was writing a paper on women in education, and I googled about education in the US. What did I find? That in, the, in Harvard University, 
women were given admission 237 years after men were given admission. I repeat, 237 years. In Oxford and Cambridge, it took them 265 and 67 years to allow women. Even today, 2021, 99% books are written by men from their perspective, all books. That's why most men get Nobel Prizes because we women are hundreds of years behind. We were not allowed. Even today, 95% vice chancellors are men. So, everything about our institutions is patriarchal. In the 80s, we women in Delhi started talking to the NCERT and said, please look at your textbooks. They are full of patriarchy. Please, let's change it. Father goes to work, mother cooks. Nonsense. Utter nonsense. 80% Indian women have never had the luxury of being housewives. They are farmers. They are laborers. Only middle class and upper class women have the luxury of being housewives. All others are both housewives and farmers and workers and laborers and teachers and professors and pilots now. So friends, it is people who have to change. And how do we do it? Yeah, about that we can have a discussion. How do we change people? I feel we begin by looking at ourselves. This is the most scientific way. The Buddha also gave us this way. Look at the reality. So let me look at my reality and you look at your reality. Am I patriarchal? Am I gendered in my clothing, in my everything? The way I talk to people, the way I address my wife, the way I expect things from her, what I expect from my husband. So, normally when we talk of gender, we talk only of women. So I'll focus more on men today. But it is relevant for women also. And I will talk both to the teachers and the students. Because teachers sometimes are more patriarchal, belonging to the earlier generation. So on gender, teachers can be more conservative, more backward. And I'm addressing that. There is no harm in learning from younger people. All the time, younger people, all the time were ahead and that's what we want them to be. I want my children to be my teachers as soon as they go to a better university than I could go to. So let's ask a few questions. First, let's look at our families. Is uh, my family patriarchal? How do I find out? I find out by asking Who is the considered the head of my family? Mother or father? In whose name is the property? The house. Did our mother get any property from her family? Or she came penniless to a stranger's family? Did she change her name when her owner changed? Earlier, the owner was father. She had his name. Now the owner is the husband. The word husband means controller. The word khamind means lord and master. The word pati means owner. Lakhpati, karolpati, owner. These words are against the Indian constitution. 
they should be scrapped at least now majazi khuda one is haqiqi khuda and the other is majazi khuda the local god in every house there is a local god that fellow who comes drunk every evening my god my god did she change her name who is more educated in our family mother or father who can order whom have you ever ever experienced your father being verbally physically violent to our mother think about these things are sons and daughters getting equal food equal education equal health care do they get the same freedom can girls go out and play like boys do can they come back home like boys can do boys and men do household work or that is too lowly a work only for women do women wash even their dirty clothes have they ever washed your mother's clothes these are simple questions you can ask today just now go back home and ask these questions to see how patriarchal each one of us is about personal behavior as a boy did i get more love more care raja beta as a boy do i order women around my sister my mother do i respect women if i respect them i cannot order them around will do i expect to get more family property than my sister will i accept it quietly and forget about my sister did your brother did your father give property to his sister so he walked away proper simply do i as a man urinate in public and think it is my right as a man do i use four letter words easily do i tell and laugh at sexist anti women jokes do i enjoy looking at looking at women leering at them teasing them we can go on and on and on asking these questions so based on my experience and studies and many many researches i can tell you that most of us are patriarchal i who have been working on gender and feminism even today after 50 years i find patriarchy sitting in some corner of my mind of my belief of my language each one of us has to work on it i have to continuously work on it so friends if we change the maps will change in the end i want to say make five more statements to work against patriarchy we have to work also against caste and race and class and i believe it is our constitutional duty and all colleges believe in the indian constitution so it is your college duty to work against patriarchy and then it's your duty second we feminists are against patriarchy we are not against men many men have been our partners from the beginning i don't have time to explain but i want to say here something in my opinion enlightened people like the buddha 
like Jesus Christ, like Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like Guru Nanak, they were feminists. They were anti-inequality. They were human rights activists. They wanted everyone to be equal. Their followers are not feminists. They are takedars because they are not enlightened. They create churches and mosques. And during COVID also, they will make the Ram Mandir. There will be no oxygen in the country, but Ram Mandir will be created after demolishing a mosque. This is not religion. This is hatred. I'm sorry. So we are not against men. We are against patriarchy. Next point. Unless women are free, men can not be free. Because men and women are not separate. If the wife is not free, can the husband be free? If a sister is not free, can the brother be free? Dowry, you think is a woman's problem. Who collects dowry? Rape, you think is a woman's problem. Who does rape? Who does sexual harassment? Who does domestic violence? Actually, friends, if men change, things will change. There'll be no rape if men change. No rape. So, next point. Some people think that gender equality is a zero-sum game. Women will benefit. Men will lose. Zero-sum game. No benefit. Not true. I can't explain. My time is over. Gender equality is a win-win game. The day I as a sister can stand up to my father and tell my father, father, my brother wants to do music. He does not want to run your silly shop. I will run your silly shop. Let brother do music. That day my brother will be free. The day my partner, the man I marry, is convinced that if I get COVID, she will manage the family. He will be free. But if I am a woman who can't do anything, neither can my brother, nor my father, nor my partner be free. So friends, thank you very much. I think I've gone about 10 minutes above my time. I'm sorry for that. I thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Kamla Basin, for that inspirational talk where we all ought to be facilitators for change in this transformative society. So it is uh, time for all of us to create a new morale, a morale that definitely does not discriminate or disrespect one another and reshape the unequal power relations. So now the floor is open for discussion. Uh, there are a few questions on the chat box. I will uh, just read them. So the first question is, there's a lot of conversation about man- Rose, 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 Rose. Yes, ma'am. I like to know the name of the person who is asking so that I can address them with respect with their name. Okay. It is uh, uh, Mr. Guru Bhagavadi. So he says, there's a lot of conversation about manhandling cases in Pakistan on minorities. He wants to know what is the action that has taken so far from the human right, human right act activists or other groups. I want to tell Mr. Guru Bhagavadi that is not the topic about Pakistan and I will not waste the time of the group here. I'm sorry. Let's talk about your life, sir. If you want to tell me, are you patriarchal? What are you doing in your family? 
that is what i want you to talk about about yourself and not about pakistan not about bangladesh that is the way to say we are perfect it is those pakistanis and i will not go that way sorry thank you very much okay the next question uh, this is from uh, ophelia de souza she is a second year bs student from st anne's so she is asking knowing patriarchy is a problem which we recognize as the main factor that hinders justice can patriarchy be removed from society ophelia de souza if patriarchy is not created by nature by god if you believe in one then it cannot be removed but whatever studies have been done we have created patriarchy just as we have created caste just as we have created religions so if patriarchy today is considered illegitimate by our constitution which says men and women are equal why did the indian constitution have to say this men and women are equal they had to say it because the world was saying two years before this the universal declaration of human rights said all human beings are born equal and free in dignity and rights so our baba sahab ambedkars and other people who were fighting caste who were fighting patriarchy they said yes so yes ophelia if you and i and everyone else follows the indian constitution believes we are all human we are all born human and then we are made man woman man woman means my social definition with these dupattas we are all born human and then somebody tells me you are a hindu i was not born a hindu i was made a hindu the day i was born without my permission nobody explained to me listen hinduism has caste system nobody told me listen islam considers women like this or in christianity god is he then i could decide do i want to become a christian or not or a hindu or not nobody asks so i believe earlier we thought race uh, we thought slavery could not be removed we thought monarchies could not be removed we thought the british could not be removed from india but they were the problem is they were outsiders they could be thrown out the difficulty with patriarchy is it is within the family so difficult to tell your father he is being unjust he is being unfair my own father had six children three daughters and three sons gave me freedom to do whatever i wanted but the only one house he had a property no big deal no big money in that property but he shamed himself by giving it only to the boys before his death he proved he was a patriarch and i'm sorry for him so yes ophelia if i thought patriarchy could not be removed i would not have had gray hair like this working against it thank you ophelia uh madam uh, guru bagewadi is asking another question so please can we see that if there are other people before he asks a question no there are compliments for you there are no questions here on the chat box okay then please mr guru bagewadi welcome sir okay uh, when was the rama mandir building constructed or started is it before the pandemic or uh... i would ask him to please look at the topic what is the topic today and that was just one line 99% of my talk was 
on gender and patriarchy and education, what he does. So I like him as a teacher to tell me, what would he like to do for gender equality and inclusion and to fight patriarchy rather than to divert the discussion? I'm very sorry, Mr. Guru Bhagavan. I will not be diverted. I'm not here to waste my time on questions which are not relevant to this talk. They were in the context of equality that I was talking, not when and here and there. In the context of saying all these systems are systems based on inequality and I'm fighting inequality. On that, if he wants to tell me some stories from his teaching, how he is teaching people equality from his two questions, it seems, it seems that he's probably not teaching equality. Probably more worried about Hindu Muslim, but not in a way that wants to remove the inequality, which wants to follow the Indian constitution. But I'm just guessing. Participants could be unmuted also in case you all want to ask questions to the speaker. I'm reading some of the messages. Thank you very much for all of you who are sending me, giving okay. strength, giving me love by your nice messages. Thanks for doing it. Thanks for saying it. I think it's important to say it. Yeah. There's a question from uh, Dr. Flossy. Uh, she's asking, how can we teachers and teacher educators in schools and colleges work towards removal of patriarchy? Just Flossy, again, as I said, first, in, in feminism, we have a slogan. The personal is the political. If I want to change something, I have to begin with myself. So again, to a teacher, I would ask, when you go to the college dressed in a particular way, what messages are you giving through your clothing, through your dress, through your shoes? If as a teacher you are walking on high heels and not able to walk fast, and if people like you, that's what you are teaching them. So from tomorrow, I would, instead of focusing on what I want to do, I'll focus on high heels from tomorrow and reduce my own speed of walking. And we'll never be able to follow a man in his speed because I'm handling my sari first and then my heels first and then my flying hair first and then my lipstick first. So I feel, Flossie, that people don't learn from our lectures so much. They learn from our behavior, from the way we dress, from the way we talk, from the way we behave. They see that before marriage, Kamla Bhaseen was some other name. Today she has this name. That she's doing Karwa Chauth festival in memory of her husband, not fast, fasting the whole day. So, I mean, I tell you one story from a school. My daughter went to a, a kindergarten, the best kindergarten of Delhi. And I went to drop her. And in a class, there was as if some emergency situation had come. And everybody was held to skelter running around, four-year-olds, five-year-olds. I enter with my daughter holding her. And the woman teacher, about 35-year-old woman, five feet, five inches, standing on a chair. What happened? Chikkali, chikkali, there was a lizard on the ground. And my daughter's teacher was on a chair, standing. And then what happened? A little boy of four went and picked up the lizard and took it away in front of her teacher. 
I felt I cannot send my daughter to a school like that where this is what 35 year old women teachers are. And a little boy is picking up. This is patriarchy. Ah, ah, 35 year old. So what do I do with such teachers? What do I do with teachers who are today teaching children stories which are totally patriarchal from A to Z? Stories like mirror, mirror on the wall. Who is the most beautiful of all? Nothing more patriarchal than this being taught in every English medium school in Delhi charging 10,000 rupees a month. Teaching these schools teaching these kind of stories. A man, a prince comes and liberates a woman, still waiting for princes to come and liberate us. So there is so much which needs to be changed in the stories we tell, in the songs we sing, in the Bollywood we see, in the TV programs we see, so much. You should see five-year-old girls dancing on these reality shows. The most sexist pornographic songs and their mother and father are there sitting. They're hoping this daughter will become this Barbie doll. So a long way to go, Flossie, but we'll go there. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you so much. Madam, there's another question from uh, Dr. Farita Vegas. It is a challenge just dealing with the percepts of male and female gender. Why are the other gender of the LGBTQ community never in the forefront of any discussion? Well, this is not true, Farita, that they are not in the forefront. But if you give me 45 minutes, to talk about education and roadmap and gender and all that. But today, fortunately, because of the movement of LGBTIQ people, they are in the forefront. They are being talked about. But we need time. I mean, when people don't even know what gender is, when people don't even know what patriarchy is, and I believe, I don't know how many of them will agree with me. If there was no gender, what is gender which defines what is a girl, what is a boy? How should a boy, boy be? How should a girl be? I think there will be no transgender. Transgender people are those who do not agree to those definitions, a boy who wants to be like a girl. If there was no definition of a girl or a boy, except a biological one, which is okay, he can have a penis and wear a sari. What's the problem? If we girls can wear trousers, why can't the men wear saris? If they want to, if he wants to cook, if he wants to dance, if he wants to sing, so transgender, only if there is gender, you will want to go beyond it. Trans is to transgress, to move beyond. So that's why I was asking the question, do we just want to bring gender inclusion? Or we say no gender at all. If there's no gender, my brother can sing and dance. He can put lipstick if he wants. And I can drive a motorcycle if I want. So I think there is discussion. I think there needs to be more discussion on that. I did mention intersex people, but I'm afraid in 45 minutes, I can't talk about everything. Thank you. Okay, friends. <clears throat> My hosts are gone. 
Uh, madam, there's a question from Joe. Uh, uh, how far do you think that the world or India or the society today is on the way towards such a change? It's... Thank you, Joe. Very, very important question and I'm glad you asked. I think we have made a lot of progress. Not because our governments were kind, but because there have been women's movements. And I would call the role of Mother Josephine as that of fighting for our rights. I don't know whether you people have heard of Mary Ward, who 500 years ago, a British nun who challenged patriarchy in England. I'm told she was jailed by the Pope because she was asking too many questions about male hierarchy within the Catholic Church. She started Loreto Sisters and I worked with them very closely in India and in Nepal. About seven or eight Loreto Sisters have been to my courses for a one month each, so we are great partners. It is the efforts of people like that. It is the efforts of visionaries like Jesus and Buddha and Kabir and Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Vivekananda and Kabir and others and the Sufis who just did not believe in these differences between human beings. So see today how many women are on this platform and in what positions we are. See today that we have a universal declaration of human rights which says we are equal. So at least on paper we are equal and that is big deal, Joe. That's big deal. Legally we are equal. We can challenge them on everything. How old is this reality? 1948 is when we got the Universal Declaration. And 1950, the Indian Constitution. Not very old. Today, in education, we women have made a huge progress. And not just as students. The biggest revolution, according to me, has been that women have entered the arena of creation of knowledge. When a woman like Mary Ward starts asking questions, when feminist theologians, be they Muslim, be they Hindu, be they Christian, be they Buddhist, ask questions. Why God is he? Has anyone seen? Is he really male? Why can't we change the gender now? I mean, it's against the constitutions of the world. Please come to some changes. When we ask questions, when a feminist psychologist can question Freud, and challenge his penis envy, his theory which he gave. When feminist historians can say, history is his story, we need to write her story. And today, there is no area of life where at least some women have not entered not in equal numbers, but they have entered. Today, I think every woman knows that no one can be violent towards her. She may not be able to do anything, but she knows violence is a crime. She knows she can go and talk. Today, women are saying, me too. This professor, this director, this journalist, this editor did it to me. Me too. It's happening to me. I will not tolerate it. We have made a huge, huge progress. 
And today, I think the biggest progress we have made is all over the world for the last 25, 30 years, men have started organizations and networks. I'm working with one of them, which is a global network called Men Engage Alliance. Men are getting engaged with the question of inequality. Men are looking at patriarchy and saying, does patriarchy only harm women? Doesn't it harm men? Are men born rapists? No. If men were born rapists, then how can there be a Buddha? Men are not born rapists. Men are not born violent. 80% men don't rape. So how do we become rapists? I think patriarchy makes us rapists. You are a man, you can do anything. You are entitled. You are a man, you are the master. We call you pati. We call you majazi khuda. So you can give a tight one to your wife. Don't forget you are the head of this family. He is dehumanized. He is brutalized. His insaniyat. His humanity. His compassion is taken away from him. By patriarchy. You give him a gun when he's three years old. And then you're surprised. How did he become a terrorist? You taught him. How is he beating his wife? You bloody taught him. The father used to beat the mother. So the son is now beating his wife. You taught him. We are all responsible for bringing up boys like this. Today we have a slogan, Beti Bachao. This is the worst slogan a country can have. Save your daughter. From whom? Not from China. Save your daughter from her parents. Can anyone do it? Today I say, save your sons from patriarchy. Save your sons. Save your institutions from patriarchy. Save your religions from patriarchy. So Joe, we have made a long, long way. And I come for these talks today. 64 of you were there when I came. 51 are there now. Many may be on Facebook Live. I come to reach out to more and more people so that we don't have to wait for another hundreds of years to bring equality. We can do it faster. The faster we bring equality, the more beautiful our families will be. A patriarchal family cannot be beautiful. A violent family cannot be beautiful. Haven't you heard that in COVID, violence increased in our homes? And the first country to report that was France. These are men. Are they human? That during COVID, they are beating their wives? Can that home be peaceful? Can it be loving? Where a wife is constantly afraid. So if we want happy homes, no place for patriarchy, no place for gender. If we want happy societies, no place for patriarchy, no place for caste, no place for majoritarianism. No place for greedy class system. You know how many trillionaires have become richer during COVID? How many black marketeers have become richer during COVID? So Joe, I am totally hopeful. Otherwise, I will not be giving a talk on a weekend at age 75. I celebrated my 75th birthday recently and I gifted myself a bicycle so I can be mobile again on a bike. Thank you. Thanks a lot, ma'am.
very informative very useful and it was very helpful any participants would want to ask any more questions or we can wind up thank you very much madam for your excellent talk thank you amir hasan sahab thank you very much So thank you participants for your wholehearted involvement in the discussion with uh, Kamla Kamla Basi and thereby elevating today's lecture. So this day was made possible by many hands, hearts and minds that have worked together. So to express our words of appreciation and gratitude we have Dr. Sharmila Maskarenis, assistant professor and secretary of the Alumni Association to propose word of thanks. good day to all on this virtual platform let us be grateful to people who make us happy they are the charming gardeners who make our souls blossom says marcel proust dear friends i deem it my privilege to express my feelings of gratitude and appreciation to all those who have made this day a memorable one i take this opportunity to thank our esteemed guest an eminent speaker kamal kamla bhasin feminist activist new delhi we are grateful to you dear madam for accepting our invitation to deliver the mother dosfin memorial lecture for the year 2021 you have very well touched upon the areas of gender patriarchy and inclusion by looking into our daily lives and into our education system each one of us present on this virtual platform has experienced your knowledge and wisdom we thank you wholeheartedly for your goodwill and greatly enlightened by your inspirational words on behalf of our alumni association and all other invitees i express my heartfelt gratitude to you dear madam a sincere thanks to sister mari lucy ac joint secretary St Anne's College of Education we thank you sister for being with us and guiding us in all our academic and administrative endeavors your ways of dealing with us have filled in us a new spirit of enthusiasm thanks to you sister mari lucy on this occasion i owe my gratitude to the management sister shamita a provincial sister maria shubha ac educational secretary apostolic carmel educational society for your continuous guidance and encouragement towards the growth of our institution i sincerely thank all our alumni and our special invitees especially our former principal dr sister claire ac our former staff dr anand dimatis dr amir hasan and dr pamavati for your presence and all well wishers for your kind thoughtfulness to partake in this inspiring and motivating lecture and interacting with the speaker your participation has augmented the essence of this lecture a special word of thanks to all the executive members of our alumni association your contribution and support rendered throughout the years imbibes in us a spirit of enthusiasm and self motivation my special thanks to dr farita vegas principal st aloysius institute of education and member of our alumni executive committee for suggesting an illustrious and distinguished speaker for our mother josephine memorial lecture 2021 thank you madam farita to you sister dorothy vice principal st anne's college of education and member of our alumni executive committee a whole hearted thanks for designing the invitation so elegantly within a short period of time and also very systematically managing today's online gathering thanks to dr rose pinto assistant professor st anne's college of education and member of our alumni executive committee for mastering today's program and moderating today's lecture along with the question answer session finally i wish to thank Sister Zina Pereira AC the president of our alumni association and our principal St Anne's College of Education 
Sister Maria Rupa, AC, our administrator, my colleagues and students of St. Anne's College of Education for your active participation in this very inspiring and thought provoking lecture. Thank you one and all. Thank you, Dr. Sharmila, for expressing sentiments of joy. Together with the alma mater, let us keep the spirit of togetherness alive so that a new generation of students can step into our footsteps. Thank you everyone for making time to join us on this virtual platform. Stay healthy, stay safe, and please start your videos for a quick photograph. Thank you, Kamala Ji, for that beautiful session. And a happy 75th birthday. Very inspiring, the bicycle story, very inspiring. Participants, please switch on your uh, videos just for a minute. We just want to click a photograph. They're not well dressed. <laughs> we can just have the faces together. <laughs> Just a moment. Yes, I think we're finished clicking the photographs. Thank you so much. We'll end. Thank you very much. Thank you.